morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Praise the Lord. Gonna make a comment here real quick. It has nothing to do with what I want to talk about. But there, there's a what? <laughs> I said I'm gonna make a comment here that has nothing to do with uh, what I want to talk about this morning. But there's a Dixie Chick song that there's a line in the song that says "Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition." And every time that I say "Praise the Lord," that thing comes to mind. Anyway, I never showed before, but. That's beside the point. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I I will <laughs> I will try to be brief. Hopefully, I can relay this in a way that makes sense to you. Because yesterday Kelly and I went went uh, out of state. We went to Illinois for the day, and as we were driving, I'm. I put John Potter on, and I'm listening, and uh, I'm asking God, what should I talk about tomorrow? And then all of a sudden, all these things started coming, and I'm driving, so I have nothing to write with. Kelly doesn't have any pen and paper, so I can at least dictate her some things so she can start writing it down. I can ask her to start texting to me, because I don't think she can type that fast. So, this is most of what I can remember from, from yesterday. Uh, but as I was listening, um, I, started, I started listening to his song, Enlarge Your Tent, mm -hmm. which it's, it's based on Isaiah chapter 54. And, and <coughs> I started asking God, how is this relevant? What, what do you want me to speak about regarding this? And the thing that came to mind is that we are called. You know, Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Because God is infinite. And he does not have a concept of time. Mm -hmm. What for us is like decades, centuries, and things like that. He already had all those things thought. Mm -hmm. right. So he knew that on December 20th of 1979, in what is considered earthly time, I was going to be born. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and the same thing for all of your birthdays uh, and people that were before us, people that will come after us. All those things are already, he already thought of. Uh, but one thing that I like about God is that he gave us free will. And a lot of people argue the concept of free will as being something contradictory to God's essence because they say if he already has a plan for your life, what's the whole point of goodwill if you're going to end up doing what he wants you to do? Well, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Because if that were the case, hell would not exist. That's right. Mm -hmm. right. So, this is the way that I see it. He he knew of us before, before we were formed. Mm -hmm. And then from that point, there's a lot of paths. Mm -hmm. And then based on the decisions mm -hmm. that we made, it's the direction we're going to go. But he already knows what's going to happen in all of those directions. Right. What he does is he guides us so that we end up making the right decision. Right. So bad things don't happen to us. Yes, we're going to encounter uh, difficulties along the way. We're going to find difficult people. I heard a preacher once call those people uh, sandpaper people because they, they uh, sand the rough edges of your life. Uh,
<laughs> so, uh, so uh, but the way we come to God is because he, call, he calls us. And in John chapter 6, verse 44, it says, No one come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So, this is what I was uh, going for with Isaiah 54. And I'm sorry if by the sandpaper coming, I offended someone. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm on the spot here. Uh, Isaiah chapter 54, it says, Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not been in labor. I believe that's the church. Because the church is, is, is a concept, not a person, and not birth. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married. Mm -hmm. So we are those children. And then when we come and answer God's calling, we're all coming to the barren one. Mm -hmm. And that's why the barren one is going to have more children than her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stake. For you, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. I believe this is related to the mandate we were given in Matthew 28, verse 19. Go and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because we all have been given that direction to go and tell people about who Jesus Christ is and show them who he is. And I, I spoke about this not too long ago. Sometimes those people, before their time comes, we are going to be the only uh, interaction with Jesus they're ever going to have. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. I, I really like this verse because that truly speaks about a real transformation in a person's heart. When you truly understand and know who Jesus is, you do not dwell on your past, regardless of how bad or difficult it was. Mm -hmm. Because you understand how he loves you mm -hmm. and how his grace operates. Mm -hmm. right. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you <coughs> like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit. Like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, to the Lord your Redeemer. Like the days of Noah to me, as I swore the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Now we know that there was a covenant that was made with Abraham, but then Jesus came to this earth and that covenant became a better one. Hebrews chapter 8 
verse 6 says, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old and the covenant he mediates is better since it's enacted on better promises. O afflicted one, storm tossed and not conformed, behold, I will set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make the pinnacles of agate, your gates of carbuncles, and all your wall of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. The Holy Spirit reveals to us. That's how we learn. In righteousness you shall be established, and you shall be from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife, strife with you shall fall because of you. This is very important because a lot of people that don't understand God's grace like to blame him for the bad things that happen in their life because they see them as punishment. Behold, I have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon for its purpose. What is that weapon? The sword of the spirit. What's the sword of the spirit? The word. I have also created the ravager to destroy. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed. And you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. That's us. And their vindication from me, declares the Lord. One thing that we have to constantly remind ourselves and understand is that not only is the Bible a testimony of God to his people, it's very constant in one thing. Do not fear. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Don't be dismayed. God says, I will take care of you. I made promises to you. There is a better covenant that has better promises than the old. All of the things that he has for our life, as long as we listen to the Holy Spirit and allow ourselves to be guided, will come to pass. That's the good thing about it, which is why we should not be afraid. Yes, our flesh will try to take over what's happening, you know, and you start going to get anxious and, and frustrated, annoyed, and overwhelmed, and all of those things. But you go back, and like the scripture says, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Oh, wow. yeah. That's what's going to keep you going. Yeah. So yeah. stay in the word. Mm-hmm. Understand that you have been given that weapon, uh-huh. which is the word. Yeah. Don't be afraid. We are all being called. Let's go out into this world. Fulfill yes. our purpose. Amen. Going out and ministering to people, bringing them to Jesus Christ. Amen. Because we're enlarging our tent, and there's room for everybody. All right. That actually made sense. Yes.
are not going to choose the wrong path. We are seated in the heavenlies with him now. That means we all pick the right path. Yes, we do. But the devil's the one that yeah. constantly yes. throws in our face. You're wrong. You're going. Yes. You're doing the wrong thing. The flesh is running the show. Yeah. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Yes. How much more abundant can it be yeah. if we forget about sin? Exactly. All that and put it in the background yeah. and say, look, I'm just living. I am just living. Right. I care about people. I love people. I yes. want to do good. Yes. And so I do it. Does it mean that I don't still do stupid stuff? Yeah. Oh, trust me. <laughs> Ask me. <laughs> Many stupid things. But it's not, thank God, it's not based on me. Right. It's based on Him. Yeah. He did it. My belief and my trust and my hope and everything is in Him. Yeah. And one thing we get when we accept right. Jesus Christ, is we get a hope that this world yeah, cannot Lord, take away. Exactly. I don't care how long we go, right. how bad situation is, right. we have a hope. Yes. Yes. And what is it? Jesus Christ. Right. Right. He's our hope. Yes. Yes. We yes. have a hope yes. that yes. transcends anything uh -huh. that this world has to offer. Yes. Yes. And I just, <laughs> uh, we, yes. we need to concentrate yes. and encourage one another in that. Yes. Yes. Don't worry about this, that, and the other thing. We're the elect. Yes. We've made the right choice. We're yes. here because we made the right choice. Yes. So yes. we can forget about that and just go out and be victorious. Listen, there's something coming yes. to this world yes. <clears throat> where we are going to be elevated, yes. not because we deserve it, because God yes. has a plan, yes. not just for my life, but for everyone in yes. here. Yes. And his plan is to win every one every lost sheep. Yep, yes. You know, we go back and look at those parables. They're so powerful. Yep. A man had 99 sheep. He lost one. I, I know people that say, oh, well, don't count that as a loss. Write it off, you know. But he said, no, I'm going to protect those 99, but I'm going to go find that lost sheep. That's that's the Lord. That is. There are people in this world that are elect yep. that don't know it. Yes. Yes. They, don't, they don't know it. That's who he's that's who we're to find yep. and to let them know because all of them are going to be needed yes. for what's coming. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. It's coming. Yes. And all of them are going to be needed and they don't even know who they are. That's, right. That's our job. One thing that, uh, that I like about God is be, it's that he never gives up. Right. Uh, I was raised a Catholic, and my grandmother was very hardcore Catholic. Uh, so I was baptized, I did my communion, confirmation, and all those things. Then when she passed, I saw that as my opportunity to stop going to church, because she was not going to be nagging me about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then I started distancing myself from the church and all those things. Not that I stopped believing in God, but then I got to college and I went through this phase that I started using uh, philosophical arguments to disprove God's existence because I thought it was cool. Uh, then I kept distancing myself, but then at one point I started going to a church with my cousin and I had this experience that I, I felt God telling me to ask forgiveness for my, my relatives uh, and all those <coughs> things. And then I, again, distanced myself, and then the whole thing happened about my divorce and all that, and then he put Lee in my path, and she invited me here, and I came, and then I answered, finally. Yes. Amen. He never gave up. He's never no. going to give up.
Sister Mary Ellen, who needs physical and emotional healing, and then Evelyn called and also needs prayer this morning as well, and Andrea and Vela have found a place, so they'll be moving out of our house here next week, so just pray that, you know, the Lord gives her strength and finances and everything to make it on their own. We'll still have Jayla all the time until the Lord opens up a nine-to-five job for her, but um, God's blessings upon her. Amen. Amen.
not having a problem now, but he did have a few stints in the park. Couldn't, but now his problems have been with his hands. That when he tries to do his work at um, the library, he has to do a lot of things with his hands, pushing and taking binders and writing and all that kind of stuff. And it really bothers him because of some sort of a tendon issue or something to where he braces, but he can't wear them because he can't write with them. So he needs to get over that, but he's had heels from baby. He's had everything, dog, hip, speckles, and everything, so God can take care. to be gathering your name, Lord. Give us this opportunity so that we can come here together and cast all of our burdens upon you, Lord. That we can come to you, Father, and be in your presence, give testimony to each other, bring all of these needs out, Lord, into our brothers and sisters so we can all join together in prayer and stand together in your word. Father, we know that the devil is a liar, that he tries to deceive us because the enemy comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. He wants to take away everything that you have given us and try to convince us, Lord, that you are holding out on us. But we know, Lord, that that is not true because you are a giving God. You are a God that gives us your grace infinitely, Lord. He continues to love us and give us even when we do not deserve. Father, any of the things that we receive from you. Right now, Lord, there are a lot of needs that have been presented for healing. I declare in your mighty name, Lord, using the sword of the Spirit that you have given us, which is your word, standing in that word, we declare that the healing is taking place right now in the lives of all of those that need the healing. We know, Lord, that all things, all of these things are just distractions that we receive from this foul world fallen world or this, this the enemy, Father. And we know, Lord, that you have declared seal by your stripes. Lord, you made yourself a man and you came into this world and dwelled among us. And then you sacrificed yourself, died on the cross for our sins. So all the things that have been prophesied, Father, will be fulfilled. We thank you, Father, for the sacrifice. The sacrifice that enacted the new covenant, Lord, and acted on the better promises, Father, that you have given us. We have your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you have given us as well inside of us in this body that you have declared our temple for the Holy Ghost, Lord. And we know that we have your Spirit inside of us, that we are one with you, Lord, and because of that, we can speak your word into any situation of our lives, into the lives of others. We can stand with them in prayer and declare things over their lives and know that your word as it's spoken will not come back void, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the things that you do 
Right now we declare healing, we declare prosperity. Break, O Lord, all of those that are suffering a loss. We know, Father, that you continue to guide your people to those that are lost, that lost sheep, Father, that is wandering around alone. We know, Lord, that you're seeking that sheep out, and you're sending your people, Lord, search them out, find them and speak to them of you and show them who you are, Father, so that they come to you. You constantly call us, Lord, you. You're calling us, Father, to come to you because you are our protector. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all of you, the great and wonderful thing you can do, for fulfilling your promises, for constantly reminding us something lingering right now. If, if anyone has something specific they want to be prayed for, just step forward and we'll do it right now.
maker. And if anyone is facing a situation that you feel is impossible, he's making a way for you. Receive it, believe it, know it. He can do all things. Saturday, April 22nd, first ever Women of Influence, Daughters of the King, Women's Conference. I want to just ask that uh, gentlemen, uh, people praying for the lady, for the church, for the Lord to have his way to do whatever the Lord wants to do. This is his conference. This was an idea that was put in one of our hearts. And uh, I'm excited. I don't know what the Lord's going to do. the word this morning. Yes. Will you not revive us again and your people may rejoice in you. I am a believer in these signs you follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to perfection to which God created its function. I forbid any malfunction of this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding be enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devour for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now resolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Would uh, the Wyckoff brothers please take the offering? <laughs>
manifestation of that healing to come before this, even this worship time is over. Okay? Okay. It was mentioned uh, one of uh, my friends on Facebook is asking uh, about another church um, who I used to be part of and stuff, why they don't use hymnals and stuff anymore. And, you know, I saw the coming and going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and uh, people living in the past and people wanting to move toward the future and the press and everything else like that. Um, yes. I didn't ask the question, but I wish I would have, is if you pull the hymnals out, how many in the congregation can actually read the four part? How many people in the, how the congregation can read the four parts that are in those hymnals? And I look around here in this room right now, I'm going to say maybe two, three. Uh, that's 15%. Times have changed. The Lord has changed. I love the old hymns. Don't get me wrong. There are markers in the past, and most of them are markers in the past where God moved. Yeah. And as Pastor talked about, I'm your vehicle, baby. Um, <laughs> that's that's a 70s thing. It's a 60s thing. Anyway, yeah. The Lord uses different vehicles um, to reach a next generation. I'm not discounting the hymns. I love the hymns. They touched my life when I was uh, young, uh, a couple years ago, and uh, they still touch my heart. And as the Lord manifests, uh, that's great, and we'll use them, we'll integrate them. Um, some of my favorite hymns, unfortunately, are not those hymnals that are sitting right in front of you, okay? Um, there's some Pentecostal stuff that, like, they roll the paper up off the walls and, and <laughs> knock the popcorn on the ceiling and stuff like that. They're not those hymnals, and that's okay. The Lord has given us a new day. He's given us a new heart. And His mercies are new every morning. So, every day will bow. Every tongue of
appreciate everybody's uh, testimonies and sharing what the Lord had put on their heart this morning. And I want to be uh, obedient to the Lord and, and consistent with what I feel like the Lord has given me. And I do think that it, uh, it is a reflection of what the Spirit is saying to the church this morning. And so if you'll bear with me and just try to uh, stay focused with me, I think you'll see that as well. I love what Ravi Zacharias says, let my people think. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, there's been a long time between thinking sometimes, and when it comes to religion, it's just kind of this rote, uh, ah, just follow. I know we're sheep, but, you know, come on. We're, we do have a spirit, amen, that leads us and guides us into all truth. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's what we need to be uh, sensitive to, and that's what we need to be following. Praise the Lord. So, that in mind, Roberto, if you would uh, take us to Joshua chapter 13, and I'd like to begin with Joshua 13, verses 7 and 8. Joshua 13, verses 7 and 8. Now, I'm going to remind you maybe a few times here, just, to, just for the sake of reminding. And when we read the Old Testament, and I talked about this a little bit Wednesday night too, but it's I've mentioned it many times, as others have as well, but when we read the Old Testament, it's true. These are real, historic truths, real events, historic fact. But they're also pointing to a greater truth. So that's why in the New Testament he tells us these are types and shadows. So although they are actual facts that took place, they're also because of the mind of God. We talked about this a little bit, how can God, you know, uh, without calling it, you know, in a sense we are predestined, but it's not the Calvinistic kind of way of thinking about it, but um, how, how can God have a destiny for us and then give us free will and yet know that that destiny is still going to be 
fulfilled. Because he knows the end from the beginning, and that's he's got more than I've got up here between the ears, so I can't answer all those questions. I just know that that's the way it is. So in the Old Testament, even though you have these historic events taking place, in those things, God has woven through his genius greater truths that will come yes. in the new covenant, pointing to Jesus and, of course, pointing to the bride of Christ and our oneness with him and so on and so forth. So that's the thing we kind of want to make sure that we glean out of the Old Testament. We don't just get a bunch <coughs> of facts, but we actually get the spiritual truth that God's trying to infer. And also, uh, I, I've mentioned this before too, but it's, you know, when we're dealing with people, even in the church, we look at scriptures and they kind of make us nervous about God, unsure, because we think of the Bible as being two covenants, the old covenant, the new covenant. The truth is there's at least five covenants. And within those covenants, there's different agreements. So when we see them play out in the scripture, sometimes it looks like God is mean, God's angry, God's angry. Even the world will tell you this, people that are unsaved, that's their excuse for not serving God. He's too mean. You know, he kills all these people and causes all these horrible things to happen. Well, and I, again, I'm not going through it this morning. I'm going to teach on this one of these days when we've got some time. But, uh, within these covenants, there are agreements that God has made himself bound to. So sometimes you see where, like the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham can do anything and God is still good with it. I mean, he's lying, he's cheating, he's doing all kinds of stuff, but that wasn't part of the agreement. It was that I'll be your God, you know, and it was all by faith. So there wasn't this retribution kind of thing going on. But in, within other covenants, there were times when God would agree to be the protector of his people if they would do certain things and protect them from their enemies and so on and so forth. So within that covenant, if an enemy came against Israel, God was obligated by his word to destroy that enemy. This is no different than it would have been between two human beings if they had two separate tribes and one tribe was stronger than the other and somebody come against that weaker tribe, the other tribe was obligated by their blood-sworn uh, vow to destroy that enemy or they, or they could be destroyed themselves. Right. So that's, that's part of it. The other thing is then if the people that he had the covenant with broke the covenant, he was obligated to punish them exactly. in the same way. Exactly. So when we look at covenants, we've got to realize there's more than just one or two covenants going on here. We have a better covenant than all of those covenants now because it's based on the Abrahamic covenant, but that all of those things are fulfilled in Christ, so we have the promises of God. Yes. Now, if we don't operate in the promises of God, but just in our own intellect, then we don't have any guarantees that we're going to get anything. Right. So that's why when we're praying for people, when we're doing things that we say are in the Spirit, it isn't so much what we think of the Spirit being ethereal and kind of weird and strange. It's staying faithful to the Word of God. Right. Pray the Word of God. Confess the Word of God. Because anything else you're doing is counterproductive. Right. It may sound good. It may come from the heart. It may be a real genuine desire. But if it isn't in agreement with what God has said, if it isn't something God has already done and promised in His Word, then you, it's a crapshoot. You don't know what's going to happen because there's no covenant <coughs> promise from God to fulfill it. Right. Even though it might be good. What we got a guarantee for is what God has said. That's the covenant we have. And he made that covenant with himself and he won't break it. So it, it's, it behooves us that it's to our benefit to know what the word says. When it comes to healing, when it comes to prosperity, when it comes to relationships, whatever it might be. Because that's what we need to be focused on. Not what seems to be good for the moment or what might even be good for the moment. But what is perfectly right and true with God. With what God has already done, that's what's going to happen. That's what we've got to be praying for because anything else, we've got no guarantees. It's just maybe and maybe not. If you find a word in here from the Lord, a promise from God, you can pray that, confess that, and it has to come to pass. That's all there is to it because God has promised. Yes. Now, your responsibility isn't to make it happen. Your responsibility is to declare it in faith and then stand on that truth until it comes to pass. Okay? You're not making it happen. You're just coming into an agreement and you're not being moved. Stand 
When you've done all to stand, then stand. Just stand on that word until you see the reality of it. And keep saying it because the enemy's going to keep saying something other than that. And your circumstances will as well. Okay, so with that in mind, let's read this. This is uh, Joshua chapter 13, verses 7 and 8. Now, therefore, divide this land for an inheritance unto the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh, with whom the Reubenites and the Gadites have received their inheritance, which Moses gave them beyond Jordan eastward, even as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. All right, now go to Numbers chapter 32, and I want to read the first five verses. Numbers 32, verses 1 through 5. Now, I'm not going to go back for the sake of time, but how many of you know God said, my people shall inherit the land? I'm going before them. That was all 12 tribes. It wasn't nine and a half tribes. It was 12 tribes that were supposed to inherit. What were they going to inherit? They were going to inherit the promises of God. Yes. Things that they didn't do that God had done for them. Right. God had gone before them and done it. They had to show up in faith and then obey. But God had promised, I've already, got, I've already given it to you. Yeah. Right? Now, it might not have looked like it because we know they saw giants and so on and so forth. But the reality still was what God said, and that's what the two spies earlier, 40 years earlier, had said. We're well able. God's for us. So let's go do it. Let's take it now. Let's do it. Well, they didn't. And over the course of the time, two and a half tribes decided they weren't going in at all. Now, they would go in to fight, but they weren't going in to stay. They weren't going in to possess the promise. Okay? So in Numbers chapter 32, verses 1 through 5, it says, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad... And a very great multitude of cattle. They had a lot of cows. Amen. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead. That behold the place was a place for cattle. Great pastures. Good water. Everything that a cattle rancher would want. Right. Mm -hmm. So the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest. And unto the princes of the congregation saying. Adaroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Eliot and Sheba and Nebo and Beom. Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle and thy servants have cattle. It's a place for cattle and we got cattle. Yep. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession and bring us not over Jordan. Yep. Let us have this place over here because we got cows and this is a good place for cows. It looks great for cattle farming, for raising cattle. Amen? Now, let's just think, think Abraham and Lot here. Lot looked, and Abraham listened. Who got the better end of that deal? Now, it didn't look. What, did, what it looked like was Lot made the best deal there. He got the best of the bargain. But as it plays out, we found out what God had said to Abraham was what was going to happen, regardless of what it looked like in the natural. So two and a half tribes didn't enter into the promises of God. They didn't enter into the word of God, right? They didn't come into agreement with what God had said, with the word. Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, which is one of Joseph's sons. Now remember in the Old Testament I said types and shadows are pointing us to an ultimate truth. So we will keep this in mind. Part of, of all of us, part of each of us, wants to focus on us instead of God. Yes. Instead of God yes. with us. Yes. We're still focusing on us. We know, we, we believe in God, but instead of focusing on us and God, we focus on us and God. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And the result is we don't experience everything that God has for us. Yes. We don't realize our oneness with God and with the Word, and therefore we don't get the benefits of the oneness with God and what the word has promised. Now let me give you three translations here real quick. Reuben, and this is powerful. You know, we know, so Don was talking about, we don't pick our names and uh, all these things. But under the old, under the Hebraic kind of way of doing things, names had great import. And God would choose names for people. We know that he changed names. Abram to Abraham, Sarah to, uh, Sarai to Sarah, uh, Jacob to Israel, and, and throughout the Bible you see it over and over. Jesus said, you're no longer Simon, but you'll be Peter the Rock, you know, because and, and, he's identifying the, tr the reality of that individual, the truth of that person. So look at the, the names, the Hebraic names of these people. Reuben translates, see the sun. 
Gad means troop, but the, the, the root word is to press into or to unite with. So see the son, press into him or unite with him. And then what does Manasseh mean? Cause him to forget. So you've got the word from God saying, look at the son. Look at Jesus. Look to Jesus, right? Then become one with him. Become one with that spirit, with that reality. And there's something else they're constantly lingering that's saying, other stuff is going to take priorities here. Forget it. Don't stay focused on that. All right, look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All right, look at it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All right, look at Isaiah 54, where Roberto was teaching from earlier, and verse 17, the final verse there, Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you'll condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And the righteousness is mine, yes. is of me. This is what Don was talking about earlier. We, we're all, we get all hung up on us, yeah. and this is all about Jesus. Seek him, his righteousness, yes. because any righteousness we have is his. Yes. And if we're not in him, we're self-righteous. Yes. We're operating under our own strength, and only righteousness can obtain the promises of God. Yes. That all of these covenants are based on a give and take. Now we say, well, not ours because Jesus did all the giving and we just get the taking. Yes, but if you're not in Jesus, you don't have any part of the covenant. That's why it says over and over and over, in Christ, in Christ. There is therefore no condemnation. In Christ. In Christ. In the word, we have the promise of God. We have a guarantee that it will come to pass. Yes. If we get outside of that and start operating in our own righteousness or our own way of doing things, we don't, there's no guarantees. <coughs> All right? So Jesus doesn't talk about tangible rules or, or, or laws. He's not, he's not really into current events either. Matthew 6.33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Listen to this. This is the Hebrew for things, and it, and it translates into the Greek as well. But here's the original Hebrew. Daba is the word. And it means to arrange, and it's used of words, to speak or to cause. So what does he say? Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these words will be given to you. See, words are powerful. Yes. They're greater than things. Yes. Things don't exist without yes. words. Exactly right. yes. I just heard a thing that I hadn't heard for a long time, and I preached this years ago about quantum physics, and they're talking about, you know, when we were kids, how the, the nomenclature of an atom was different than what it has been defined as today because they've got more powerful telescopes and, and, you know, the super colliders, all these things. Within the, we used to be neutrons, protons, you know, the, the nucleus and so forth. Now you have the quarks, which is smaller yet than any other subparticle. And within the quark, there's something else. And that something else that's in the quark is sound waves. So everything you're sitting on, you're looking at, we're a part of, comes from sound. It exists because of sound. Regardless of what it looks like, it came into being because of sound. God spoke, amen, and things happened, right? So all these things, and here's where the church misses it, and all these things will be added to us, and we're out trying to get things. Things come from sounds. So if we're saying one thing and expecting to get another thing, chances are we're not going to get anything. Because the thing that we're after is a word, not the physical manifestation. The manifestation will come automatically if we say the right word. So when we pray, Jesus says, 
It's not in your long prayers. I don't, I'm not interested in your long prayers. And to listen to Jesus, he never prays long prayers. He just says, what do you want? Can you believe for it? There it is. Yes. That's, it. That's how we ought to pray. That's it. I, I mean, I understand why we pray. I do, I've done it. I, I mean, because we're trying to get our faith up, and we're trying to get their faith up, and we're trying to get all these things going. When the faith is not in my prayer... The faith is not in your prayer. Faith has to be in the words that we're praying, that we're speaking. So if we're praying, no matter how fluid and flowing and beautiful and, 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 and uh, you know, verbiage, verbiage, <laughs> excuse me, no matter how much verbiage, let me say it that way, is in it, it means nothing. It's, it's the words that we speak. Four or five words heals cancer. Why? Because they're God's word. They're what God has already said. Now, if sound is at the heart of everything, then the right sound against the wrong sound will make the right sound prevail. Right? So if the enemy has said cancer, and you say no cancer, by his stripes you're healed. That word is more powerful than the word that the enemy has given, but it's which one are we paying attention to? Yep. I'm not saying they're not both factual. I'm saying only one is true. Yes. That's right. Perception is reality. If you believe that doctor's report, you're stuck with that doctor's report. But if you have a greater belief, a belief in something more powerful than that doctor's report, then the doctor's report can be null and void. It can be put aside. That's why we have the word. Not so that we can quote so many scriptures and everybody say, man, what a, man, they really are religious. They're really spiritual. No, it's so that we can operate within the contract and the covenant that we have with God. You can't get the things that God has for us without the contract. You can't just start saying anything you want. You guys that are in business, you know, you've got to make contracts with suppliers and different things. You can't just do anything you want to after you make the agreement. Right. You've got to abide by the contract. If you don't, you're in court. Yeah. We're in court all the time, and the accuser of the brethren yes. is, the, yes. you know, is the prosecuting attorney that's constantly trying to tell us one thing, and God's saying, stand on my word. Yeah. I am your defense. I'm the mediator. I'll see to it that my word comes out on top and this thing is all over with. Yes. Amen. We're trying to be our own lawyer. We're like the idiots you see go to court. They kill a half a dozen people and then they decide they're going to be their own lawyer. I say praise the Lord. Just save the taxpayers money for somebody else. But the truth is they're, they're insane. In fact, I, I forget who the jurist was, but some legal mind said at one time, he who has himself for a lawyer has a fool for an attorney. I think it was Lincoln or somebody like that. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> praise the Lord. Get in trouble. Get a lawyer. Yeah. I mean, it's just stupid. That's not your job. Yeah. Amen? So, Jesus wants to do something deeper than just having us deal with tangible rules and laws. He's trying to take us deeper than the surface, deeper to what makes the surface the surface. Right. Praise the Lord. Yeah. The kingdom of God begins as an inside job. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Mm. We speak his words in order to bring to pass his reality. Yes. <laughs> yes. How many of you know God did not write this? God spoke this. Yes, right. Men wrote it down right. so that we could speak it. That's good. Yep. Yes. God spoke it. Yes. Somebody wrote it down. And the yes. reason they wrote it down was so that we could then speak it. Yes. Look at Psalms 45, verse 1. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So my advice this morning is put your pen to work. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Start, start saying what God has said. Yes. 
Start saying what is written. That's what Jesus said. It is written. He just spoke what had been written down that had been spoken to the writers long before. He didn't make up his own deal. He didn't come up with his own way of trying to deal with it. He said, it is written. Yes. This is what God said. Yes. Hallelujah. So these two and a half tribes spoke the word of the enemy instead of God's word. God's word was take the land over Jordan. I've given it to you. Proverbs chapter uh, 7 Verses 1 through 3. And you'll see what, has, what happens to all of us. My son, keep my words. Lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers and write them upon the table of your heart. Now, if you speak the words of the enemy... You're writing the enemy's words on the table of your heart. You're engraving it into you. Praise the Lord. All right, look at Luke chapter 21 and verse 26. Luke 21 and 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Men's hearts failing them for fear mm -hmm. and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth mm -hmm. for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. <clears throat> okay, so Jesus did not say men's hearts will fail them because of things that are on the earth. Mm -hmm. He said men's hearts will fail them for fear yep. and for looking after things which are coming on the earth that aren't there yet. In other words, worrying about things right. that aren't. Right. That is true. Jesus isn't talking about heart attacks. He's talking about the spiritual part of humanity, of the spiritual part of man, the human heart, the spirit heart. I mean, it's, it's that, that word, that analogy is used throughout the Bible, the heart, the spirit of man, right. one and the same. That's what he's talking about is the spirit. Right. He's talking about... That thing, that soil that he put in you where the kingdom abides. Mm -hmm. right. The spirit. Right. Jesus is saying that the kingdom in the heart of man will fail to function properly because of fear. Mm -hmm. So what the enemy is always about is to get you into fear. Mm -hmm. Because then your spirit will fail. Okay, look at Proverbs 18 and verse 14. What's the first thing that happens when you have a crisis? Fear. Immediately the enemy comes because he knows, your, what, he knows your strong point. He knows where you can defeat him. That's by the spirit. So he's got to get you in the flesh. The only way he can do that is get you into fear. Neutralize the power. So the spirit of man will sustain his infirmity. Now look at this. Is, this is powerful. The spirit of man will sustain his infirmity. But a wounded spirit, who can bear it? The human spirit will sustain his weakness. It works both ways. The human spirit or the heart of man will hold off or hold in weakness or infirmity, whatever, however you want to define it, and work either way depending on what you speak towards your spirit. Yes. If you speak fear, it will retain the fear. Yes. Mm. If you speak power, yes. truth, faith, yes. it'll sustain it. Yes. Jesus, the word, right? He said in John 8, I only speak, I only say, that which I hear my father say. Why was he always at peace? Why was he not freaking out like everybody? Because he never said anything. He never spoke anything to his spirit except what he heard God say. Right. 
If we do the same thing, yes. we'll see some things change in our life. Yes. You'll see situations begin to change. Yes. We say it in church and then we run around the rest of the week saying something else. Yeah. Yeah. And wonder why things don't manifest. It doesn't work. That's just a religious mumbo jumbo. No, it's a covenant. And if you're not going to keep it, God's not obligated. In fact, cannot keep it. He's already done everything. It's all done. The covenant is done. It's finished. It's complete. In John 6, Jesus says, uh, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Right? Spirit and life. Spirit, life, words. Right here. Life to your spirit. Power to your spirit. That's what these are. Words carry spiritual forces. I, I, I know they do. Look, I, we had grandkids over here one uh, last Friday or Thursday or something. We had them several days last week. And uh, the youngest one, like three and a half, he, he'll be four here in a couple weeks or so. And uh, he's kind of a, he's kind of the little tough guy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I love him, but he's just kind of, in your face. You know, every family's got different personalities there, and that's it. He's sweet as he can be, but he's a little hard-nosed kid, you know. And uh, so we were playing, I don't know what, we were playing some kind of a game. Oh, I know, they had a glow stick thing. So we turned off the lights back in our back bedroom and the, opened the closet door up, and it's a walk-in closet, and then the, the bathroom, and all the lights are off back there. So I got all three of them back there, and one of them's got the glow stick, and, and the little one, he wants a light because the other one of them had a lantern, a little battery operated lantern. And so he wanted a light. So I said, well, go out and tell Nanny you want the flashlight. So she got, got the flashlight for him, and he came back in. So they're just running around. I'm scaring the bejesus out of them if I can. And I said, come on, let me read you a story. So they all climb up on the bed. It's pitch black in there except for these, the glow stick, this little lantern, and his flashlight. So I, I said, I'll, I'll read Tom Sawyer. So I'm reading the scariest part about it I can find, which is Injun Joe. You know, he's going to kill everybody, and they're all freaking out. <laughs> and so Sally's holding the light for the, ba- for the young one, and she keeps flashing it over in my face. And how many of you know you look at And no matter how weird you look normally, you look even weirder yeah. when that light's in your face. Yeah. And I'm going, and Injun Joe is right there, you know, and I'm doing, I'm doing all the sound effects. You know, and this kid is freaking out. <laughs> And I won't stop because I know I got, I'm on a roll now. You know, I got him. I just won't quit. So anyway, I'm saying words carry spiritual forces. They carry fear. They carry peace. And, and they carry all these things. Words have power. He went home and told his dad. The next morning, he never said anything. He got up the next morning, went down and climbed up on his dad's lap. And he says, I don't like him. He said, you don't like who, Engine Joe? He said, Who? Engine Joe, yeah, and I don't like him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I told my daughter, I fulfilled my purpose. I figured out some way to traumatize every one of them for the rest of their life. They'll carry this scar. They'll never. They may not like me, but they'll never forgive me. Praise the Lord. Anyway, praise God. So, words transmit fear. Words transmit faith. God's word transmits God's image. Amen? And devil's words, devil words, transmit his image. That's just a fact. So faith and fear both are simply the ability to conceive words. You're either conceiving God's words and have peace, joy, power, dominion, or you're conceiving Satan's words yes. and you're freaked out and fearful and worried about things to come. Yes. Worried about everything. Even when there's nothing to worry about, you're worried because you know Jesus. bad stuff happens in the world. How am I going to escape it? Jesus. Praise the Lord. All right, back to Numbers again, Roberto. Numbers 32, verse 5. <coughs> Wherefore saith said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. 
Now, how many of you ever wake up or have woken up in the middle of a really cool dream? I mean, everything is just, man, just what, the way you would like it to be in reality, and it's just everything is really perfect. And then all of a sudden, your wife jerks or something happens, you know, and you, wait, and you go, oh! And now you, then you, you lay there trying to recapture and think, if I go back to sleep, I wonder if I can pick up where I left off, you know, and am I going to get back into all that? All right, look at First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. First Chronicles 5. 25 and 26. So they got this beauty going for them. They got this perfect place for cows. They got lots of cows and they got the perfect place for cows. They're thinking, we hit the mother load. This is ideal for us. It's perfect, right? So they're in the middle of this great dream and then they transgressed against the God of their fathers and went a whoring after gods of the people of the land whom God destroyed before them. The God, the people that were there in the place where they were, were idolaters, right? And the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, the king of Assyria, and the spirit of Tilgath-Pneser, king of Assyria, and he carried them away. Even, who did he carry away? The Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and brought them unto Hala and Harbar and Hara, and to the river Gozan unto this day. Took them into captivity. No cattle ranch. No perfect spot. Captivity. Disconnected from God. Disconnected from the people of God. For too long. <coughs> if you read the, the, the rabbis, the history of this, what happens is they get tired of going all the way to the temple. It's a long travel. It's a long trip. So they start worshiping where they're at. Only it's not true worship. It's kind of their twist on worship. They gotta start creating their own little thing. And maybe they pick up a few little things from the people around them. And the next thing you know, God says, This isn't, you're not connected to me at all. You're just going through some religious motions that don't mean anything. You know, somebody says that life is but a dream. And if that's so, there's way too many sudden wake ups. If we're not one with God, if we're not aware of our oneness with God, it isn't long before we start inventing gods. That's called religion. It's called denominationalism. It's called everything except the relationship that was intended in the first place was just to be me and God, you and God. The other stuff, okay. As long as number one is you and God. When something else starts becoming greater than the you and God, you're going to wake up from a good dream and find out it was a nightmare. Now, I won't have you go there for the sake of time, Roberto, but Job 42.5 says, Job said, I've, I've heard of you, but now I've experienced you. Well, we know Job knew a lot of stuff about God or thought he did. He was very religious, and so were the people that he hung out with. But something happened that caused him to connect with God in a way that he never had before. And he said, that is life-changing. I knew of God. I knew about God. But now I know God. I, I had an encounter with God. And that's what all of us need. I'm not talking about an encounter. We've all had an encounter. We wouldn't be here. We need that ongoing encounter. Yes. That's not just saying, I know, I know what God did for so-and-so. I know what God did for Jane. I know God healed Jane. But I need that same God for me. Yeah. It's not enough for me to know what he did for Jane. It's great to know that God does this stuff. But the day might come when I'm standing there with the doctor's report, and now i got to believe in that God. He needs to be my God. He needs to be one with me now. Yes. And that's this awareness of God. Amen? Yes. Experiencing God in, other, in ways that we haven't. Amen? That's, this is inside out teaching. That's what God wants to do. Yes. Be led by the Holy Spirit. is isn't God come around, put a hook in our nose, and drag us around. It's being led yes. from the inside out right. by the Spirit of God. Right. All right, Matthew 23, verse 5. All their 
works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. I saw a t-shirt the other day, and it said, uh, may your life someday be as awesome as you make it appear to be on Facebook. Oh, jeez. I thought, man, if that isn't a shirt for the new millennium, I don't know what is. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm not going to go, I, I t for the sake of time, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. Uh, you can go to Deuteronomy 6, don't do it, I'm just saying. You can go look these up yourself, Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 12. And Numbers 15, 38, and 39 talks about these very things. Phylacteries were leather boxes with straps on them. And they contained bits of scrolls or scriptures. Bits and pieces of the word of God. Yeah. And they would bind them to their arm and to their forehead. Those are types. Now, they actually did it, but they were types. The real meaning, of course, is to be one with the word. To have it be a part of your life, be a part of you, amen? amen? One with God. So that wherever you go, God goes. Wherever God goes, you go with him. Yes. But they were black boxes on the forehead and on the left arm. So that everybody would say, wow, look at the size of the black box on his forehead. He must really be spiritual. I liked it. <laughs> They're spiritual. Yeah. And then they had tassels on the garments. That's the other thing it talks about. They were, there was a border of blue ribbon. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and Jesus said, you know, you make broad your, your, your borders, you know, your, har your garments, right? So they were there so they originally... In, in Numbers where it talks about it, we're there so you would remember what God has done. What You would remember God's word. Yes. Amen. But here they decide they want whiter ribbons. Make broad uh -huh. your hymns, you know, your, your skirts, praise the Lord. Why? Because they thought it would make a broader statement. Yeah. It's all signage, yeah. in other words. Praise the Lord. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm Pentecostal. I'm charismatic. But more than all of that, I want to be one with God. Yes. I'm not against expressive ways of, of reaching to people and doing things. But that isn't my priority. No. So if you think he's just not spiritual, you're free to think that. You have every right to think whatever you want to think. <clears throat> but it has nothing to do with what God's word says. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm after. I'm not bothered by other people that get caught up in it. Because I, I get caught up in it sometimes myself. Yes, sir. But I, I want to make the distinction. Yes. That I don't. Whether I do or don't is not the issue. Right. It isn't what you think. Exactly. It's what I know. Yes. It isn't what I might think about your thing. It's what you know about your thing that matters. So if you're reaching people by the word of God, however you're doing it, I'm good with it. But Jesus said they went about this thing all about them. It was to draw attention to them. Now, come on. We know in a huge segment of, of, of Christianity, quote, unquote, Christianity, there, it's more about the people that are doing it than it is the God they're representing. Now, I'm not saying good things don't happen, but that's not God's ideal. That's not what God wants, and that you are in a crapshoot when you do it. This, if you use the word of God, all responsibility has been taken off of you. I'm just saying what God said. If you believe that, you got it. You can't judge me. You can't criticize me. You, can't, you can do all of that, but it doesn't mean a thing. Because I'm just trying to stay faithful to what the Word of God says. And if you will, you are promised results. Yes. Not because I prayed for you, but because I said I was in agreement with what God said. Yes. And you yes. believed it. Yes. Yes. Right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Yes. I can't do anything. It's the Word in me. It's the Father that's in me. He does yes. the work. Yes. Yes. 
And I've got, if Jesus said that, I don't have a problem saying it. I'm not uncomfortable saying it. Praise the Lord. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. Don't, don't go there, Roberto. I'll save, save you time. Uh, just go to Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 4. 1 Samuel 16, 7 is where Samuel goes out to find the next king. God doesn't tell him who the king's going to be. He just says, go, he's in Jesse's house. Right? And what does he say? Well, to paraphrase what he says in Samuel 16, 7 is, man looks on the outside, but I look on the inside. Praise the Lord. If we limit God's power to what we think of the person or what they, how they appeal to us, we've just limited God by however many number of those people you feel that way about. Because God likes picking the ones that we look at and say, ain't going to use them. He loves to just, pardon my friend. Bitch slap us every once in a while. Yes. I mean, just remind us. You ate all that. You're, you're just not everything you think you are. That's right. That is true. <laughs> praise yes. Yeah, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. If you will, Roberto, I want to read all the way through verse 11, so just continue on. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. This is, what, this is exactly what Don was saying, just in, you know, paraphrasing it. He was saying the very same thing. We can, we're all hung up on sin and blah, 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 and it has nothing to do with that. If we recognize we're focused on our relationship with God, our oneness with God, that stuff will take care of itself. Yes. We're human. We're going to do stuff. I just did that probably offended somebody. I don't care. I'm not trying to offend you. That's just stuff like that comes out of my mouth every once because I'm ignorant. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I just don't <laughs> proofread everything like I should probably, even when I know I'm going to say it and it'll do it. But, okay. I'm just saying. Yes. We're one with him. Praise God. And if we're one with him, then we're dead to sin. Has no more dominion over us. Has no impact on us. Has no effect. It's as though it doesn't exist. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. If we're dead with him, we know that we live with him. Verses 10 and 11. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. In that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon yourself also to be dead indeed to sin. Not, not that I can't sin. Not that sin doesn't, not that, not that. It's that sin doesn't exist. Reckon the fact that sin doesn't exist anymore as far as you're concerned. Because you're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord. This is about oneness. It's about position. It's not about audition. We're not trying to get some role here. We've already been crucified. We've already been raised up with Christ. We're already there, seated with him in heavenly places. We just need to be, that has to be our focus. Put your mind on these things, things which are above what Christ seated in heavenly places, not the stuff that you think is coming, may come, may not come. See, if we look on the surface of everything, we become like those two and a half tribes. Yeah, that's so true. This looks good, yeah. but where's God? Yeah. Or we focus on the problem. And getting to the end of me means getting over myself. So that real me can experience my real reality, yes. my real life in Christ. Yeah. All right, I won't go there again for the sake of time. I'm going to try to get through here as quickly as I can. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 29 says that we are, just exactly what we talked about here, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. 
right? So we're, we're, there is no condemnation, and we are predestinated. We were sought by God, found by God, picked out by God yes. for a destiny. Yes. The destiny is to be one with Jesus, to connect with God. All right? Isaiah 54, and you don't have to go there either, Roberto. I'm trying to get through this. Isaiah 54, 17, the other scripture, the scripture where Roberto ended up, what does it say? Any tongue that tries to condemn you, right. you condemn. Yes. Why? Because there's no condemnation for you because you're in Christ. Yes. This is the heritage or this is, the, this is what you receive when you come into Christ. Yes. That's your inheritance. Yes. Righteous. His righteousness. Yes. No condemnation because you're in Christ. Yes. So you can see that when we deviate from that, when we make it about religion or make it about certain things that we do, we leave ourselves open for the enemy to come yes. and trample all over us. It isn't, the, it isn't that that's no longer a fact. It's that it's only a fact if we understand it to be the fact. Right. I mean, it's only perception, again, unless we realize it and are functioning from that reality, then we're just kind of out here being bounced about by the enemy, by every wind of doctrine, by everything the enemy wants to come and throw at you, yeah. if you're not centered and grounded in this yes. reality of, of this particular truth of God. Yeah. No condemnation. God sees us just the way that we are, without pretense, without performance. He sees us one with him. Yes. And when that happens, you will see him. You'll see manifestation. You'll see God. So two and a half tribes said, let us stay over here. We don't want to go to Jordan. We don't want to cross over the river. And so fear of change stops us from experiencing everything that God has for us, that God's life wants to give us. That's why people won't leave their denomination because it was what I'm comfortable with. It's where I've been. It's what mom and dad took me to. It's what this was. It's what that was. Most of us have come through different, you know, things. Why? It was a little frightening, but we thought, God's trying to tell me something. God's trying to lead me somewhere. That's the way the Spirit of God works throughout our entire life. We don't arrive. You know what I'm saying? We're just, we're being led by the Spirit because the moment you get fearful of change, I'm not saying changing the word. I'm saying we need to change to where we are living this yes. word, yes. not our kind of combination of religion and word. Right. Amen? Right. Because when you do that, revelation stops. That's why we've got 50,000 different denominations, because every time God would lead somebody to a new revelation, the people that already had the last revelation said, hey, well, that isn't God, because it didn't come to us. Right. You know, it ain't smoke unless it's coming out of my chimney. Right. So... The, that group that got the new revolution, they got a revelation. They got to move on and start another church because they can't operate in that new revelation in the old church. And it just keeps happening over and over and over. Okay, so what happens is then we end up settling for a good thing instead of reaching for the best thing. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And that's where God meets us, right at the end of us. He, that's so that God can determine your future, so that he can lead us, so that by his grace, it's not what you can offer. You're dead. It's what he wants to release through you. He chooses you. Praise the Lord. I'm skipping some scripture just so we can get through. I, I don't want to quit before I'm done, but I don't want to keep you here all afternoon either. So maybe if you're like most people, you feel like, well, I got issues, man. I mean, or I got some self-doubt. But listen to what I'm saying. This is what the scripture is trying to get across to us. That issue is precisely what God wants to use. Your weakness, Paul said. Your disqualifier becomes God's qualifier. I've taught this on Wednesday night over and over and over. All of these times we think, well, come on. If we, looking back, hindsight's twenty twenty, So we can see all these people say, yeah, 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 yeah. But the truth is, had we been there, we'd have said, that is the last person I would have picked to do this. 
Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Roberto. And it just says, if this gospel is foolishness to everybody, right? Except to those who believe. Right? For the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved is the power of God. So what is he saying? Our entire faith is built on God being glorified through what looks like to everybody else failure. Yes. Yes. Is it any wonder then? Is it, should it be any surprise to us then that God takes our weaknesses, the things that we're most paranoid about, and uses them to further the truth, to further the gospel, to bring glory to himself? The biggest reason you can't get it done is the exact reason that he can All right, Colossians 3 and 3. Yeah. We're getting there. I'm about, I'm about there. Praise the Lord. You're dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Yeah. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to be redundant, but I just want to get this into our thinking, right? So just like the two and a half tribes, your real prize, your real goal, if you will, in life is hidden. And you have to know where to look. Yeah. Praise God. Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. It's not hidden from you. It's, it's hidden for you. That's what life is all about. That's really what life is, is the pursuit of this destiny. All right, so then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, Matthew 16 says, What if you actually catch what you're chasing? And then only find out that God was on the other side of the river. And you only partially captured all that God had for you. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to read all this again for the sake of time, but John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Then it goes on about all that God is doing through Christ, bringing us into this relationship with him, being one with him. Amen? So the word was manifest in you, for you. Amen? Yes. That is revelation. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Now, I said this. I'm going to repeat something that I said Wednesday night because there were, most of you weren't here. So yeah. those of you who were, just don't listen or yeah. say amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. But uh, in the early 70s, I lived, for, I lived several years in Aspen, Colorado. I was a bartender and waiter and yeah. some of my kind of hippie days, you know, right out, right out of the military and stuff, and I was just kind of, I wasn't trying to find myself. I was trying to run away from myself, praise the Lord. I had already found me and didn't like what I found, so I was trying to get away from that. But nevertheless, in Colorado, <clears throat> obviously there's lots of mountains and a lot of skiing, and Aspen, snow mass was a new thing at the time. It was just up the road, and I worked there in a, in a fondue restaurant, Tower of Fondue whole other story. But nevertheless, it was a new resort at the time. So every in this, this time of the year, in the spring and, and later, there'd be avalanches. Snow starting to melt. It, get, it becomes unstable. St same stuff you've been snowing, 150, 250 inches of snow. People have been skiing on it all winter. All of a sudden now, the whole thing can come rolling down the mountain in no time. It happens. It would happen every year. And people would get buried in these avalanches. Now here's the wisdom of these rescuers because they'd go out and they'd go looking and start digging for people. They'd have dogs, rescue dogs and everything else. They'd find where the person, where they had to find the scent and then the dog, they'd start digging and they'd keep digging and they'd keep digging and they'd find that the person had dug deeper. Sometimes 20 to 30 feet that person would dig down into the snow until they were exhausted and then die of suffocation. They were actually digging away from 
where they wanted to go. So the, the theory is this. Spit before you dig. Now, it may sound stupid, but if you're covered with snow, there's almost no way to tell which way is which. But gravity still applies, even under the snow. So you dig space away from your face as much as you can, and then you spit. And if the spit falls directly away from you, you know you're facing down and you need to roll over. Right? If it falls to one side or the other, you know you're laying on your side. Right? So you've got to adjust for that. Now, I said... This could be the only time you really want to spit in your own face. <laughs> because if you spit and it comes back into your face, you know you're facing up. Yeah. And that's good. Up is good. Yeah. When you spit, you learn up from down. Yeah. Praise the Lord. You see, the only survivors are the people who challenge the logic of up and down of spirit and flesh, of religion and relationship. Praise the Lord. We're looking for light. They're looking for light. They're digging to the light. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that are just digging deeper and deeper and deeper and, got, and getting no closer to the light whatsoever. I don't want to be my labor in vain. Now, I'm, I'm not laboring to be saved, but I am laboring to enter in to his rest. Praise the Lord. So look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is the last scripture. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God yeah. who loved me and gave himself for me. Yes. So this, the world that we're in, and, and, and a lot, a big portion of Christianity even the portions that are declaring themselves to be spiritual, is upside down. They're focused on the flesh and calling it the spirit. So what looks like up to us is really our perception. It's our self-focus. And that's the death that Jesus asks us to die. If you'll die to yourself, he tells us here, this is, this is, I, 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 you got to make a choice because this is your reality right here. That's the death that we have to die in order to experience God life, the spirit life of Christ Jesus in us, right? So all the way back to the beginning, I said, see the son, become one with him. And don't let anything cause you to get it. Yes. Cross the river. Yes. Spit and dig for the light. Praise the Lord. Yes. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand clap. Yes. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your patience this morning. Amen. Let's, let's, let's be who we really are. We don't, have to, we don't have to be anything other than just relax. And live out the reality of the, what God has created us to be. Amen. We don't have to prove anything to anybody. God has already declared us righteous. The most powerful thing on this planet. A believer who knows the authority that they operate in. Amen. God bless all of you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.